Join us for an interview with Neil DeKrasik, a CEO who gave up a life of wealth to dedicate himself to creating Jazzberry, an innovative organic rice producer that's helping lift Thai farmers out of poverty. Now, let's meet the great man himself. Over to Neil. I really started with a very simple idea, which was to eliminate farmers' poverty, uh, to start a business with the main purpose of taking farmers out of poverty uh, through creating innovative, delicious, and healthy organic products for the global consumers. Okay, let's get into this. Earning just 40 cents per day due to poor yields, rising costs, and inefficient agricultural systems, Thai farmers are among the poorest on earth. With farmer debt tripling, poverty impacts 17 million farmers in Thailand alone. It may come as no surprise that rice is the most important food crop of the developing world and is the staple for more than half the world's population. In developing countries alone, more than 3 billion people depend on rice for more than 20% of their calories. Yet for something so treasured by so many, the people who cultivate it often face stark realities. In Thailand, where this week's interview originates, the agricultural sector is seen as inefficient with the United States Department of Agriculture suggesting the country's yield is among the lowest of the eight major ASEAN rice growers and lags far behind its chief export rivals, India and Vietnam. Without change, most Thai farmers will be destined to remain in poverty, causing those who would consider farming as a career to consider more lucrative professions elsewhere, with research showing a drop in young farmers aged 15 to 40, while those aged 40 to 60 saw a rise in agricultural labor. But there's still hope, and that's where this week's guest comes in. Neil DeKrasik co-founded Siam Organic to develop Jazzberry Rice, a non-GMO organic rice variety that's become part of an inclusive business model that's helping farmers increase their yields and earnings. Beginning with just 25 farmers in the first year, Siam Organic is now working with over 2,500 farmers supporting 12,000 people through a model that's helping farming families out of poverty one grain of rice at a time. In our interview, Neil describes growing up in privilege while always fostering a desire to help others. He'll describe how spending a year sleeping on the floor of a poor farmer's home completely opened his eyes to the true effects of poverty and how a bold phone call led to an informal agreement with a leading scientist on the product Neil and his team would eventually bring to the world and a lot more of what it takes to build a business from the field up. We hope you find the story as inspiring as we do. Um, so, I'm so pleased to welcome um, uh, an amazing, accomplished business person that I had the pleasure of meeting uh, three years, four years ago now at Oxford University as a finest, finalist in the Chivas um, Social Venture uh, Competition. And the thing that struck me about my guest today, Neil, was, um, first of all, the uh, origin of his business and, uh, and how transformative his business has become. And I am um, so pleased to, uh, to hear from you four years later uh, to tell us that story again and to also tell us about how much progress you've made. So I'd just like to thank you, Neil, for joining us. And, uh, and maybe you can start by telling us, first of all, about your business. Like, wh what does your business do? What's it called? And, and of course, what is its full scope? Um, thank you, Robert. You know, as I'm thinking about what, what to say about what I do, uh, it, it's getting more difficult because uh, it's been almost 10 years now that I started on this, on this journey. Um, I really started with a very simple idea, which was to eliminate farmers' poverty, uh, to start a business with the main purpose of taking farmers out of poverty uh, through creating innovative, delicious, and healthy organic products for the global consumers. So that was the original concept of why I started Jasperi, uh, which is uh, now a social enterprise, and we are actually the only certified B Corp company in Thailand. Hmm. So uh, our at the very core of why we exist, uh, I, I came to discover that there's more than one reason. The, one of the reasons why we exist is to really support over 500 million um, small-scale holder farmers in the world, leaving less than $2 a day. Um, the other reason why we exist is really to create transformative, nutritious product for everyday life, um, for 
in particularly the area I work in, which is rice, is a staple food where more than three and a half billion people eat rice on a daily basis. Really, basically provides zero nutrition, also causes a lot of health problems like diabetes. So actually, for us, it became increasingly more important to look at at people's diet、um, on a daily basis. So, can you tell us a little bit about your background?、Um, you mentioned that you're originally from Thailand, but tell us about like how did this how did this journey start for you? Like, what was your family background? Where did you come from? And and did you did you believe that one day you'd be in a business like this? Like, where did it all start? Yeah, like I think it started.、Uh, I was born here in in, in Thailand,、um, and I'm a Thai national. At the age of fourteen, I moved to Australia. Um, not not speaking much English at all,、um, going to a foreign country where I was the only Asian student in a school one thousand boys. It was an all boys school,、mm. and as you、mm. can imagine, it was nineteen ninety seven. Racism was not,、uh, let's say, a big deal <laughs> back then, and so I was in a boarding school where、uh, I looked different from everyone else. I could not speak English much. So I really、um, that started for me、uh, to battle.、Uh, to, I had to to battle to to work hard、um, to find myself more to find、uh, how I could stand out and how I could be successful.、Um, so I think that that experience of being in Australia and also I was、um, I spent most of my time in Australia in the countryside. So I was in a farm. Uh, where there was only animals and, and plants, so I really grew up in that environment where the nature was、uh, something that was a huge part of my life.、Um, but actually, the, there is a story、uh, to say about this, which is that、uh, when I was a young kid, I had a hero, and you know, I'm sure a lot of most kids have that hero growing up, and most of my hero was. Uh, people like Martin Luther King Jr.,、um, Nelson Mandela. So these were people that I listened to their public speaking, and I listened to their, I read about their life, and I was fascinated by how purpose was such a central theme in in their、um, life journey. But there was one、uh, gentleman in particular that was my my hero, and his name was Subna Kasatian. He was a Thai environmentalist who got a scholarship. He came from a very poor farming background. He got a scholarship to study in England,、uh, in London, and、uh, got a national scholarship. He came back and he chose to work in the environment、uh, department for the Thai government. And his job was to prevent illegal logging. So back then we had a lot of rainforest, and、uh, you know his job was really to protect the wildlife and the forest. As a result of his work, a lot of People, businesses that were profiting from illegal logging and extracting resources from the forest,、uh, became very upset, and they kill one of his team member, who he worked with,、um, mm-hmm. and threaten to kill his family. So one night,、uh, this gentleman could sue. He wrote a letter、uh, in his little hut in the forest, and he got a gun and shot himself in the head. You know, at the age of forty years old. So this letter became started the largest environmental movement in Thai history, and this forest is right now the largest rainforest in Southeast Asia. So his life and his death ultimately transformed this country, and saved millions of wildlife and so forth. So he was my hero growing up. So I really had a strong burning question and passion to find something. That would mean to my life as much as it did for his life, because I just said, "Hey, if you are willing to die for something that you do, wow, you must love it a lot." And being are you, sorry, Neil, can I? Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Are you saying that that was that was something that when you were young you realized was something that was important to you? Yes, it was.、Wow. I was a very curious child. I was one of those kids who always asked questions, like why, you know, why, why does this happen? Why?、Oh. So I was always looking for the why. And when I came across his story,、um, his why fascinated me. Said how how does this person work? You know, he got a scholarship. He was very intelligent. He could have worked anywhere and got a good career.、Um, You know, he is from a poor family himself, 
So he had a lot of reason to have a better life for his parents and his his uh, wife and his children. But yet he chose to do something that he really believed in that actually wasn't for himself. It was for, in this case, you know, for, for trees, for, for animals, um, and for the country. So it really fascinated me. And I remember going to Australia. I had already had this seed with, inside of me. And I was uh, 16 years old. I remember um, sitting in a school bus and we had an excursion to Sydney Opera House. So I was with um, my best friend at the time, Duncan. So we were 16, we were sitting in a bus and Duncan asked me, he said, hey, Neil, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, you know what? I want to be an environmentalist. I want to go back to my country and work to protect the environment, um, like my hero. And I said, so Duncan, what, you know, what do you want to do? So Duncan is this, you know, blonde hair, blue eye, surfer, Aussie kid. And he said, I want to uh, go to Africa. I want to start a school to help underprivileged children in Africa. So we were 16, and this was a very short conversation. You know, fast over 10 years, I was 26, and I was an, invest an investment banker. So I was, you know, wearing a suit to, 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 to meeting, uh, meeting CEOs and, and uh, wealthy uh, people. And I got a school newsletter from my high school. So I had lost touch with Duncan after university because back then we didn't have Facebook and all of that. So I, and I never read this uh, publication. You know, they always just send me a news, newsletter to ask for donation. <laughs> That's what, you know, high, high schools do. And I, in, in this instance, I actually like opened it up. I was in my office and there was an alumni um, coverage. And I opened up and I saw this page of this guy with the very like old shirts, you know, ripped pants, and he was surrounded by African children. And I started reading this story and I said, oh, this is Duncan. So I recognized him straight away and I said, oh, so I started reading it. And as it turned out, he, he got a national scholarship. Uh, so he was one of the top performers in Australia. Uh, when he graduated our high school, he studied education and, and he moved to, to Africa to pursue his passion. And, and it just brought back, you know, so many emotions and memories and, and realizing that, man, what am I doing with my life? So the next day I, I quit my job. I, I went to see my boss and I said, look, I'm quitting. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to do something that, that, that I always wanted to do in my life, which is to make a difference. So, you know, he thought I was crazy. My father thought I was crazy because my father, my father is one of those, you know, rack to riches story. My father came from a very poor family with, with five siblings, with a single mother. And he, and he was a self-made millionaire. So my father, um, you know, when he knew that I had quit my job, he, he called me out and he's like, what are, what are you doing? And I said, look, I, I, I need to, I need some time off. I need to rethink where my life is going. And so that I would say started this journey, um, to lead me to where I am today. Um, so I have to thank Duncan. I, I talk a lot about Duncan in all my interviews. I haven't seen him yet. He's not on Facebook. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting, uh, but one day I will find him and I will thank him. In that, person. <laughs> that is incredible. I can like, first of all, that is a brilliant story. When I was 16, I was mainly focused on trying to get fake IDs so I could go into bars and drink underage. <laughs> Interesting the different trajectories that you and Duncan were on compared to what I was focusing my attention on. But so remarkable. So so how how long after you read about Duncan in that newsletter did you actually take the step to to do something with your with this business? Yeah. Well, well, I quit my job the next day, so you could say it took less than 24 yeah, hours. Literally, to literally, <laughs> you literally quit the next day. That's incredible. So I quit the you next are, day. And, yeah, so it took less than 24 hours to do it. <laughs> Actually, I knew, I knew it straight away already when I read the article. I just needed a day to, to pack up my stuff and <laughs> get stuff organized. So this is... 
I mean, first of all, incredible. Well done, you. Um, just uh, very quickly, how long did it take your father to come around to your way of thinking? I would say about five years. <laughs> did he actually ever formally come come forward and said, okay, I get now why you did this? Yeah, you know, this is there. Look, there. Uh, I've been doing this for 10 years and there's so many incredible stories. But for my father, it's a pretty incredible story because I started Jasper uh, three years after that moment because I, 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 I started exploring a lot of this social business idea and a lot of them hit, hit the wall. You know, uh, I couldn't do this because of the government. Because in Thailand, we have a, a military government and it's quite corrupted. So a lot of the thing you're trying to do for society and environment, you run into politicians, you run into, into people who are very powerful, who do not want to see improvement in those areas because that's like giving power back to the people. It's much better to rule a country where people remain poor and illiterate. It's a lot easier than to, to rule a country um, where people are educated and have freedom of speech. So yes, unfortunately, as I'm sitting here, the military still rules Thailand after the coup d'etat seven years ago. And, right. and you know, so, so a lot of these ideas were really difficult to get off the ground because it would be like going against the system. Um, so, so I had to go to business school to, to, to kind of, you know, really spend more time about it. And of course, I met my co-founder there. But actually, I do want to, to interject quickly with my father. Uh, he, when I first started it, uh, well, when I quit my job, he thought I was crazy. He, he called me up and I was in backpacking in Vietnam at the town, you know, writing ideas now. And he said, look, since you don't have a job right now, um, why don't you go to a business school? And, and I thought, oh, okay. So I said, okay, I, I never follow my dad advice ever, right? I was quite a rebellious child. So like for once in my life, yeah, this sounds like a good idea. My father was like, you've been away from Thailand for so long. You have no friends. Why don't you go make some friends here, here in Thailand? Oh, yeah. Okay. I go, I go to the business school. I make some friends. Fine. I'm still, I'm still, you know, thinking about a business idea anyway. But I remember when I first launched uh, Jasper, uh, we had a, we had a launch party, like uh, the Jasper rice, which is this new variety of ultra nutritious rice. So we launched this product. And I organized like uh, this little event to, to, to thank people that have supported us. So that had been, uh, you know, two years into the journey. Uh, so it was five years since, you know, when I quit my job. And, uh, and I remember I invited my parents, of course. So my father turned up to this soft, you know, product launch event. He walks into the room and he saw the, the deputy prime minister. And, the, and who is also the minister of finance, who is the second most powerful person in the country. And the, the minister, you know, the deputy prime minister walked straight up to my father and he said, you know, Swadikra, which is how we greet, you must be so proud of your son. Put his hand on my dad's shoulder. My dad was like, what did my son do? And then, uh, and then he turned around and he saw, um, you know, a billionaire who was the richest person in the country is worth about $60 billion. He's there. And he called, walks up to my father and he said, wow, you should be so proud of your son. So my father was shocked. He said, what, what, you know, what I thought you were doing this social business. You're trying to help farmer. You have no future. You're not making any money. Why are all these people turning up? And I said, dad, for the last two years, these people have, have, um, so I have come across these people and they've supported me in some ways. Maybe just buying the rice, giving me a mentorship or advice. And, and after that day, uh, he never asked me again, like about why I'm doing this. So I guess for my father, having other successful, a lot of successful people in one room who congratulated him on my whatever accomplishment I had was, was good enough for him to be like, after that, he was like, Man, this is my son, you know. Um, That's amazing. That is... I, I was going to say that, uh, that alone is a brilliant story. So, Jazzberry is this, as you say, Jazzberry today is this kind of super nutritious rice. But um, 
you know, I know that the business is more than that and don't want to get into that, but I'm, I'm, I'd love for you to describe how business school uh, led you to identify Jazzberry as the ultimate opportunity. Yeah, I think the business school, what it gave me uh, for one thing was a team. Because I think like when you, when you want to start a company and people have these ideas, you can't do it by yourself, right? You need a team. So you need co-founders, you need, I mean, technically you could do it by yourself, but I think that's extremely difficult. And I think if you're going back into the history of um, any successful company, you have at least two co-founders. And whether it's Steve Jobs right. and Steve Wozniak, and he was a guy who built a computer. So Steve Jobs couldn't have done what he did without the guy who actually built Apple. So, you know, I mean, um, yeah. So, right. so, so I think the, the first thing that it gave me in a business school is, is to meet people, to meet like-minded people, to meet people who are passionate about business, who are passionate about entrepreneurship, and who are also on your wavelength. They had good education. They have been exposed to travel internationally. So there's a lot of people with a similar mindset. So I would say like that, that gave me the foundation and confidence to be like, I'm not alone. Um, and the second, I think is, uh, particularly where I went to Satsin business school, which is, um, partnership between Satsin, Wharton and Kellogg in the United States. So I had a lot of really great professor who were very entrepreneurial. So they gave me a lot of understanding on entrepreneurial finance and really just to push us to think about what we can do in the world uh, beyond, you know, let's say going to work for, for Nestle and Unilever of the world. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but they really said, okay, what, what is it that, that, that inspire you, that, that makes you, you know, wake up every day. So I had a lot of this amazing professor who really inspired me. Um, yeah, but the, this idea, uh, the other thing was we had a lot of business plan competition uh, at the MBA level. So, you know, they asked students to write business plans, submit them, uh, pitch and all of this. So for me, I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity because I have all these ideas. And now, you know, if I have a real business plan, uh, if I think about all the aspect of business, then I get uh, judges and mentor who then look at my plan. It's going to help shape and polish my idea. Um, so yeah, so this is where how Jasper was or first started was in the I think it was 10 p.m. one night. Me and four or five people, and we already decided we're going to do a business plan together as a as a student team and be a student team and. And I, and I, I remember, you know, we just had this conversation. I said, ah, um, why don't we do a social business? And then they were like, what do you mean? I said, well, why don't we do a business uh, that has a social mission at the core? Um, it can still be profitable and scalable and everything else that the other businesses can be, but, but is, uh, exists for something much more meaningful. So I said, okay, so what? This and I said, I've been reading about, um, at the time, this was uh, 2011, uh, Thailand had a lot of news about rice pledging scheme. And rice pledging scheme is very simple. It's the idea that the price of the rice, the global price of the rice uh, fluctuates a lot. So the government said, we're going to guarantee a purchase price for the rice, for the farmer. And... And in principle, people might think, oh, this is a great idea. The farmer is going to be able to sell rice at a higher price. Um, but at the time, there was just a lot of negative news about corruption, that the money never reached the farmer. Actually, it reached uh, the rice mill, which were owned by politicians. So this was like everywhere. And I, and I started learning more about this problem of farmer's poverty and find out that in Thailand, we have almost 17 million people who are fa rice farmers in the country and then living less than $1 per day. They're earning less than $1 per day. That is six times below the poverty line in Thailand. Um, and this is 25% of the country. This is one in four person. And I said, this is incredible. In Bangkok, like, you know, if anyone's ever been to Bangkok, it's one of the big cities in the world. And you would not think that there is this kind of poverty that exists in Thailand or that, that the one in four person is suffering from this. So I started learning more and I said, wow, why, 
as a Thai person, I don't even know this. And none of my friends know this. And I said, this is huge. Like this is, this is, uh, this is crazy. So I started to dig more and more. And I said, look, our social enterprise, you know, can tackle this problem. And so, and so, you know, my friends were like, oh, so how do we start? How do we take this? And I said, look, we need two things to be successful. We need innovation and we need marketing. So we need something that's going to make us different, which is innovation. And marketing is just communicating that to the consumers. And I said, okay, so we, we're going to look for the best rice innovation in the world. So I asked this question. I said, okay, so how are we going to find this? And I said, okay, I'm going to find the best rice scientists in the world. <laughs> Right? So it's a very simple concept. So I said, okay, how do we find the scientists? And I said, well, we have Google. This was 2011 and we had Google and, and, and it took, it didn't take long. It took maybe 15 minutes of searching on Google. Okay. Luckily, the best rice scientist in the world is a Thai person and not French or Brazilian. Um, so fortunately, it makes sense because we were the world's number one rice exporter. And despite, you know, uh, you know, Thailand being the world's number one rice exporter, our farmers are among the poorest in the world, which is, an, which is very ironic. So I, so I told uh, my team and I said, look, we need to send him an email, send him a letter. He worked for a university. We need to schedule this meeting. And it took like, I don't know, three or four days and no replies. So we sent more letter, more email, no reply after a week. I said, okay. Clearly, uh, this is not working. So I used my investment banking skill, but I found his mobile number on the internet, <laughs> which is what investment bankers do all the time. And uh, yeah, so I called, I called him up and he was in a meeting. I remember <laughs> he said, who's this? And I gave a 30 second pitch of how I'm this, you know, MBA student who's going to change the world through his innovation something along this line he must have been like what the fuck because because you know this is uh i mean it is really random uh and, uh, yeah, and i'm like i'm gonna sh you're gonna help me change the world like you know this kind of conversation <laughs> and he, and he must have been like, you know what neil i was gonna yeah. say it's so funny because from your perspective you're probably thinking this guy must think this is crazy, but I bet she's never had a phone call like that. Oh yeah. So he, how can you not listen, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, this, I, I leave him hanging in suspense. And he must have been like yeah. waiting, like, what are you gonna say next? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, that's it. Uh, you know, can I talk with you more? And he came out of the meeting, he walked out of the meeting, and we were on the phone for more than an hour. Um and it was quite incredible. So, so the next day, I drove three hours to his house outside of Bangkok um, in, a, in another province, and we spent five hours together. And I remember, you know, for me, this is the greatest rice scientist in the world. He has accomplished everything there is to accomplish in the field of science, uh, especially when it pertains to rice. And I remember the first question I asked him was not about his work or anything. I said, what is your goal in life? And, he, and I, <laughs> I asked him that. I go, walk in and this guy, you know, he's very well dressed, very stylish and, you know, genius. And he's like, so what do you mean? And I said, what's your goal in life? And he thought about it. And he's, and he's like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know? and I, as, if, as if like, I, you know, he didn't understand the question. And I said, well, well, you know, you are the best rice scientist in the world. There must be a reason. There must be a bigger reason why you're doing what you're doing every day. And surely your reason is not just to find the best innovation in the world. There must be something that, that drives you. And he said, and he thought about it. He's like, yeah, actually, you know, I, I started this line of work because I want my innovation to help people. So, so I worked with rice for 30 years because, you know, he came out with, with a rice breed that is resistant to flooding, a, a rice breed that is resistant to drought. 
you know, in most incredible, and this is non GMO, so it's through natural cross breeding, and it take up to like 15 years to even develop one variety. So this guy, he's persistent and persistent. He said, "Look, I want um, my innovation to truly help people." So I asked him. I said, "Has your innovation helped people?" <laughs> and then, uh, and then of course, I knew the answer to that question already. Uh, before I ask the question, because in Thailand, if you're a researcher working for the government, for the university, they just stay in the library. They never mm. come out. Mm. So you can spend 30 years uh, with, you know, uh, coming out with the greatest innovation. You will never see the light of day because there's so much. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, wow. it's the case with everyone, but. But I mean, you know, for him, he is the best in the world in his field. So, so yes, if you're a researcher, I mean, there are levels to it. If you are that great at, at a level where you could win a Nobel Prize, your, your research should come out to the world. Like it, it, it right. should make a difference right. to the world, right? It shouldn't just stay in the university and you, right. and you shouldn't right. just be teaching, you know, 18 years old kid. I mean... Nothing there's anything wrong with that, but your your skill and ability demands more uh, from you, and 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 I think your that ability have impact. Impact. yeah, your ability to have impact exactly. Right. Uh, unfortunately, right. yeah, he I, when I asked him that, he's like, "Yep, my work hasn't really made any impact. <laughs> hasn't really helped people." Wow. And I and I won every award there is to win in science, so it's. It's pretty crazy. So how, so how, how old was how he old and how old were you? So I was 29 years old. Uh, yeah, I was yeah 29. And he must have been 55 at the time. So he, in, a, in an amazing way, he immediately sees an instrument in you to get out of the library. And to, to to enable that impact to, to happen, I'm curious about that though. Did you, because that's the <laughs> it's almost like a storybook, you know, that idea that you've got this wizened, accomplished scientist who has this desire to impact the world, but whose research never got to the market, and it needs a 20 year old who's full of he's got a fire in his belly who wants to change the world to take his work and get it to the marketplace, right? I mean, it's a storybook in a way, but when you asked him that question, <laughs> like what was in your mind? Why were you asking him that question? <laughs> Did you see the opportunity the way that that storybook suggests or, or were you just provoking him? No, I think, I think the way I connect with people is to truly understand uh, what, what their gifts are in the world. Like I, I believe everyone have a unique gift to the world. This is my personal belief. I've had it belief since I was little. So my way to connect with people is to find out that why. Like why do you wake up every day? What drives you? What makes you happy? So for me, it's getting to know this person underneath the scientist, because there is this great scientist. But I needed to understand and I wanted to understand what drives him and what for someone that has accomplished what he has accomplished in life. What is there left? I mean, what is still driving him? Because, you know, I don't, I think in some ways, my father has taught me to be hungry, to, to stay hungry. My father is 71 years old now. He has, is as driven now as he was when he was 14 years old when he first started working. He had the same energy as, as 71 than when he had when he was 14 and has zero dollar in his bank account. So I think that he taught me a lot about staying hungry and knowing your, your purpose. And I think that I was trying to find, you could say I was trying to provoke him a little bit, push him a little bit to see what is there inside, like in his heart, not just in his mind. And um, for me, like, I believe that if, if we connect, if we truly share the value, then we can work together. But if we do not share the value, then it will fall apart at some point. So for me, it was important to understand him from a human being, from a human level that, okay, what is this person? What, like, who, who is this person? Um, and it doesn't matter that he was 55 and I was 29. When it comes to values, it really rarely changed. 
and who you are really change from the age of 15 to 70. So for me, it was just a way to understand him. Now, you're, so when you went to that meeting, I mean, to be honest with you, that whole journey of identifying the guy, sending him letters, calling him up, going to his house the next day, I mean, again, it is this, it is so inspirational because it's so, it so demonstrates that, that it is possible, right, to do something like this. So you spent five hours with him, but without, necessarily knowing what would come out of that five hours. So what was that five hours like? And, and how did you know the idea when you saw it? Well, yeah, he, he was, I, I told him, I said, look, I have this idea of uh, starting a social enterprise that, that would change the life of millions of farmers in Thailand and around the world. Um, and I and I want and I, I cannot do this without your help, because your innovation is what truly has values. Um, so anyway, he started going through his research, which are hundreds and thousands. <laughs> and at some point, I was like, "Well, I'm not the technical person here." <laughs> like, I, so he started really going technical into a policy. I said, "Look, okay, can we step back and <laughs> you know maybe just keep it simple." I mean, do you think there's any research that, <laughs> that actually, so I said, okay, what is like your best research? You know, what, what do you think is your best research? And I thought about it. I was like, yeah, actually I, um, I developed this variety of rice, which, which I, I believe is the healthiest rice in the world. And I said, well, that sounds good. So you said you, you develop the healthiest rice in the world, the healthiest rice in the world. I said, well, why is it so healthy? So he started explaining it to me, it had a low glycemic index which, you know, obviously food with high glycemic index, you have diabetes, high, you know, starch to sugar conversion, at incredible antioxidant level, you know, three times higher antioxidant than blueberry, seven times higher antioxidant than kale, compared to regular rice, 270 times higher antioxidant. So it's said incredibly um, nutritious, it's dark purple, it's beautiful rice. So the first thing I said was, okay, can I eat it? Because... If it tastes bad, then no one wants to eat it. So we cooked the rice while we were talking. It takes about half an hour. Cooked the rice. I started eating it. And I said, oh, my God, this is incredible. It's so delicious, aromatic. And I said, this is the idea. And, you know, he's like, he's like this guy comes in. I, I listened to all these technical details, and I was like, Hey, if it not doesn't taste good, no one's gonna want to eat it. So, so there's straight away. Yeah. I was thinking about the market. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah. So it was. Uh, so it was uh, simple to me, like something uh, that is healthy and delicious as food. People will always want to eat it because it's delicious and it's healthy. But delic the delicious thing has to come first, because you know Thai people, we are all about food. Um, yeah. so that's why Thai food is so popular around the world. We are so yeah. sensitive and picky with food. Actually, I don't know if you come to Thailand and you, and you see Thai people order food, you, you will, it's like, um, it doesn't look like they're ordering food. It looks like, um, it looks like they're, they're going to, uh, to like a custom made, uh, tailor shop and ordering a perfect suit. This is how Thai people mm -hmm. order food. So they will give you exact detail. Like, I don't want the, I want the noodle to be firm, but not too firm. Like, you know, and imagine the poor waiter who, who will take the order. You have to remember, and of course they cannot remember the 10 requirements from each person, but this is very normal for Thailand, for Thai people. And so for me, like, I know that food is something that is super sensitive when it comes to taste and texture. Um, so luckily, um, this rice was incredibly delicious and it's healthy. Um, so I asked him, I said, look, if I start a, a social business, it's going to help farmers and going to take this rice to the world. Like, what do you think? And he's like, so how does that work? So I said, I'm going to write a business plan first. You can look at my business plan. If you're happy or not happy with it, then I'm going to start a company. So that, that, but that was like that. And we just shook hands. And so, sorry, Neil, I was going to ask you, um, 
Did you ever actually establish with him? Did you ever ask him? What did you think would a guy, 29 year old student called you up out of the blue? Did you ever ask him what he thought when a 29 year old student shows up at his house after all he's accomplished and asks him, uh, so what's your purpose in life? <laughs> like, did you ever ask him in that moment, you know, in red, you know, looking back what he thought about this, this young guy that had walked into his life? Yeah, I never asked him that question, actually, because we were so, I mean, into, <laughs> intense in the the conversation. <laughs> um, um, but actually, looking back, I've, I've had a chance to speak with him years later. And one of the things that he told me was that uh, he felt that I was very honest and direct. So I, I didn't hide anything. I was just very, very simple and honest about what what I wanted to do and how and how he could help in that journey and that we share uh, this desire uh, to make a difference. So, uh, and especially particularly to help the farmers. So I think that, you know, looking back, it was about honesty more than anything that he responded to. Because, because look, I, I understood that we may have spent five hours and wasted five hours of our life and go home. And nothing, and nothing could have, you know, materialized. And that was a possibility, right? So, mm. so what did you? What was the actual agreement you came to with him? It was, uh, you know, we didn't think about it <laughs> through very well. Of course, we were just like, okay, you, you, you give me the rice uh, uh, seed. I'm gonna find a farmer, and uh, you teach them how to grow it. <laughs> that was really. At the basic level, and of course, we um, we run into a lot of problems after that. When you take it out to the real world, there's a hundred different problems, uh, and whether it's uh, you know the farmers uh, did not believe in the project, or uh, you know we even have some farmers cheated us, uh, stole the seed, and never grew it, and went and sell it to someone else. So it was like. We, we went through a lot of these um, experiences uh, did not go to the plan that, that we first thought. Um, yeah, so, so I, I, did, I did, you know, do the business plan and all that, but when I, when I eventually started. Sorry, Serena, I was going to ask, so what was the original plan? Like, what was this, the plan in its simplest form? How are you going to take this unknown, you know, uh, strain of rice and turn it into something that would change the lives of farmers. So what, what was the plan? So the plan was, uh, we, that I would manage, I would take some time, like three to four months to go into the field, to get to know the farmers, to learn, uh, the value chain, their entire, uh, rice value chain from seed all the way to, to, uh, market. Um, and, after I do this research, uh, we we need a processing plant. You know, we need a rice mill. So we actually have a rice mill uh, because he works for an agriculture university, which is the largest agriculture university in, in Thailand. And they have like this little rice mill. Actually, the purpose of that rice mill was for students to come and study. And I said, this is perfect. So the farmers grow the rice. We're going to bring the patty rice to your mill in the university. And we can mill the rice and pack it here. So, so he said, "Well, that um, let me talk to the university first. <laughs> and anyway, so so he he had to do some homework on this side. And I remember the dean of the university was like, "What? We gonna sell rice? Like this is <laughs> actually like legally? I don't even know if the university could do that because they're set up as an education <laughs> institution. And then suddenly they're like." Well, we're gonna we're gonna mill the rice and pack it here in the university, and we're gonna obviously have to charge money and all this kind of stuff. So we were breaking a lot of rules for sure. Like <laughs> even even like that's against um, the law. Like you cannot start a, a, a university and suddenly start packing rice and having a factory in, in the university. So yeah, there were just to touch on it that we you know I took a, a few months to go through all the operational step to do this, what I, what I require from the researcher was really um, the, the original seed 
and to teach the farmers how to grow the rice. And um, on the processing side, that he would use the university facility to start this project because we didn't have a lot of rice to start with anyway. So it was big enough um, to mill the rice, to pack it there. Um, and then, you know, I would purchase everything and then sell it to the market. Um, but yeah, it was in, yeah, it was. Yeah, so, the idea, so the idea was that you would take a, you know, a very distinct uh, strain of rice that had all these nutritional, incredible nutritional properties. And you would convert farmers who were earning less than a dollar a day to exclusively producing this crop of rice. So obviously they think, here's this rich kid comes along from his fancy university with this purple rice and wants me to basically put my entire, albeit limited livelihood at stake <laughs> to create this product. So what was the, what was the commitment? Like, what did you, what were you telling them that they would get by doing it? Yeah, like this is this is a lot more challenging than co hauling the researcher. Actually, <laughs> this this makes this this make the first part a walk in the park. Trust me, the second part we yeah. just talk about because it is their livelihood. It is it is yeah. not a, not a, uh, something that that a twenty uh, nine year old kid can just come and say, "I want to change the world," and they're gonna listen. Um, so yeah, this this was a. Uh, 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 you know, process where I, well, I didn't say I pretend, so I was technically still a student. So I went down to this cooperative and I went to meet with many of them in the northeastern part of Thailand, which is the most impoverished area. And I said, hey, I'm a student and I'm here to do some research. So they did not know that I had this idea or anything. I said, okay, so, and, and I said, okay, we'll, we'll give you like compensation for doing research together. And I said, okay, so what, like, what kind of research? And I said, um, I am researching on organic farming, on organic rice farming, and how that can help uh, farmers get out of poverty. So I said, okay, I, I already planned that, you know, they would grow in the organic uh, method, so no chemicals and all this kind of stuff. So I was down there with the farmer for like a whole year, um, pretending that I was a student, which I was at the time, so I wasn't lying <laughs> to them. And, um, and I was actually like sleeping in the house, uh, sleeping on the floor. One of the, one of the things that I learned in that year, because, because, you know, like a lot of people talk about social business and talk about changing the world. And you see this a lot in, um, well, I, I'm not going to criticize anyone here. It's just more that it's a, it's a mentality, right? Like, for example, mm -hmm. in, in Nigeria and all these African nations, you have a lot of these NGOs there. And they're primarily from like San Francisco, you know, rich white kids from Harvard. And they said, hey, I'm going to help you know, African people. I'm going to work on education. I'm going to work on, uh, on agriculture and all this kind of thing. What, I, what always fascinated me was like, all this solution was not coming from the people. We're coming from you. Right. Did the people even want it? And, and what impact would it have on their community and their life? And, you know, at, at a simple level, imagine if a, if, a, if a village has no electricity and one day you go in there and actually my friend started this company, he had a, a water bottle and he said, this is all we need for light. So he built this organization where they put something inside this bottle of water and it turned into a light bulb and he helped millions of people. And... And I said, oh, <laughs> incredible idea, right? But then how do they maintain the light? Do they need to pay for electricity? Uh, uh, you know, is, is there a replacement cost? What is it? Because I started to think, like, if you give them this and it becomes the light and then it breaks down and you take it away, it's even worse because now they've had a, uh, they've had a test of it. You know, so, so you're raising their expectation. You're changing the fabric of their community. So I always felt that for me, it was really important for me not, not to go down that route. So I decided to spend the first year just understanding what it's like to be a farmer and really understanding their life, understanding the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, what do they do? 
what what does poverty feel like? You know, like when you say you earn less than a dollar a day, it's just a number. You don't understand the daily right. Right. challenges, right? Um, yeah. yeah. How exhausting. How exhausting it is to get that less than a dollar a day. What, you know what the impact it has on your on your children and their future, and what you eat. I mean, the whole exactly. I mean, it's all encompassing. That less than a dollar a day occupies your entire life. It's yeah. not an absolute thing. Absolutely yeah, right. It's amazing, it's amazing so, insight. So for me, like I was like, I knew they're gonna see me as this kid who. Who is you know well to do? He studied in Australia. He speak English. He comes back to Thailand. He and he has this kind of uh, you know uh, like I'm better than you mentality. Right. So I hear, hear. Yeah. Like so, I needed to show that you know what I respect you as much as anyone in my life. Uh, you know, I truly, I truly want to be your friend. I truly want to be a part of your community. I want to understand you. So that I can understand better how we can actually help you, or maybe we can't help you. I don't know. So it was a very. I'm I'm really curious about. I mean, I think first of all, what you did is absolutely the right thing to do. It makes total sense. Uh, most people wouldn't do it, and I'm so I'm curious what what did that experience teach you? Um, how did it change you? How did it change your outlook? Yeah, like it's, you know, I'm getting emotional about it now because just, just thinking about it, because it did, um, it really impacted me a lot. It's, and it's just, you know, when, when, like the experience that I've had up to that point in life, um, of, Cause I I was lucky enough that I had good education, that I traveled to many countries in the world, and I met a lot of amazing people. But but you know these people they they um, they have nothing in life. They I mean from a from a material standpoint, let's say they have no car, they have no uh, they have a lot of debt, they have no money, they have no clo- you know good clothing, they have you know. J- they have the best necessity in life. And what really um, inspired me a lot is they're just the most beautiful people. Like, it's, um, it's really hard to explain. Like, I remember going into their home, you know, and, and they said, hey, um, eat with us. We cook for you. You know, we, we give you food, everything. You can stay at the house. I said, okay, well, thank you so much. Like, is there anything I can do for you? You know, I was a student and I said, maybe um, give them some money. And they said, no, I don't want money. I don't want money from you. I just want to take care of you. This is, I mean, how many people in life do you know that have nothing but yet still give everything? It's, uh, I think it's very um, inspiring for me. It was then, it still um, does now. And, and it's like, and most of them were like this. They just welcomed me with open arms. I'm just a student doing some research, you know, like they opened their homes, uh, I got to know their family. They, um, yeah, they really embraced me and just, with, just have the biggest heart. Just have the biggest heart. And um, and I remember sitting down and, and having some conversation with them, and and I asked uh, one of their farmer, who was one of the leader. He he was seventy three years old, and he's still you know waking up at four a.m. and and doing like back breaking work. It's very physical. I could barely handle it at twenty nine. He's he's seventy three. He's doing this you know six seven hours a day, and um, and I sit down with him and I said. I asked him, I said, are you proud to be a farmer? And he said, um, he paused like for a long time. I was always taught as a kid that the two most prestigious profession in the world is to be a teacher and to be a farmer. Because a teacher, you know, is teaches the future, of, you know, changes human, you know, uh, help, help 
young people grow up to be quality hum, uh, human beings, be quality citizen of the world. And farmers give us food. They provide us with food. And here I am sitting with this incredible human being and he just so broken down by the system. And, he, you know, he looks at me in just total silence when I asked him if he's proud to be a farmer. So I asked him another question. I said, do you want your children to be farmers? And very quickly he said, no, I don't want my children to be farmers. And I said, why not? And he said, I don't want them to be poor like me. And it really, it really struck me. And I said, you know what? If I can do something to change this in this lifetime, it will be a worthwhile endeavor. So this is... You know, I mean, I think that obviously such an extraordinary story. Do you know what always amazes me is when you... It always amazes me that people aren't more moved. Like the number of people, you know, living in London, which is an extraordinary city, uh, you know, and, and part of what makes it extraordinary in a weird way is just the the the, the polarization of people and their income. You know, you've got people that are living in one of the greatest cities in the world that are, you know, that are, are desperately poor. And, and it, then you've got people that are living at a level of wealth, which is, which is unseen in most cities in the world. And you just look at these people and you think, you know, you're driving around in a supercar, you're shopping, you're spending your day shopping at Harrods. You know, you're, you're boasting in the media about what you're acquiring in life. And meanwhile, many of these people come from countries that unfortunately have desperate poverty. And I just wonder what, how it's not possible to be more moved, right? Like your situation is talking about as a child being moved by people with a sense of purpose and, you know, and just describing this experience of living with these farmers. I mean, it's so beautifully put the way you put it. So when, so that experience of spending a year, you know, uh, living with them was really, as you say, about, well, one, I, in almost a, a byproduct of that experience was getting to know them, but fundamentally your purpose was to actually go into work to see the product being developed, understand the technical aspects of taking a seed and getting it produced. So what, um, so your goal ultimately, remember when you first told me about this idea, you said one of the things that we faced was, first of all, we needed to convince people to start doing things a different way. But the other was you had to go and create a market for it, you know, a market that's already overserved with rice. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? Like after you'd spent a year doing this and learning all of this and, and getting a limited harvest, you then had to go from working the field to putting on a suit again and going out and finding people to buy it. Can you describe what that process was like? Yeah, like I, I always had a big dream, you know, like um, that that when I first started this, this journey, I didn't want um, Jazz Reed to just be a small social enterprise that was doing good. I wanted to make change at a bigger level. Um, so, so I remember... Um, while before I went to spend time with the farmer, actually, I I was doing my business plan competition, and I had a chance to to uh, compete in a in a, uh, let's say one of the competition in the United States. And at the time, uh, Whole Foods was was very famous. So I said, like, "Hey, you, where where do I see the jasmine rice? Is in Whole Foods." That would be like the ultimate thing, right? One of the ultimate thing is, yeah, I guess it's like being an inheritance and, and being this prestigious uh, supermarket. And I remember I didn't have a product then. I, so we, I did some mock-up with some designer um, to, to like visualize, hey, what is what the packaging looks like? Jaguar. So we came out with packaging everything. I remember, I said, okay, so now I got to talk with someone from Whole Foods. So, you know, like all of these were like so difficult. So, okay, well, how do I talk with someone from Whole Foods? And this is, this, this is a real, and I will tell the story. This is one of the craziest stories for me because I went on LinkedIn and I found this guy and he is the business development director at Whole Foods. 
So he's a uh, you know very senior person at Whole Foods. And I remember I got his email, so I started emailing him. I said, hey, you know, can can we talk on the phone for like five minutes? I have this project, da da da, and the the healthiest rice in the world, and all this kind of stuff. I must have sent like easily like twenty emails without replies <laughs> <laughs> to the same to guy. To the same guy. <laughs> and um, yeah, his his name was Dev. I'm not gonna tell you his surname, but Dev. So I I you know Dev a lot, and I started calling him. I, so I call uh you know the the call center at Whole Foods in the headquarters in Austin, Texas. So I kept getting a voicemail. It's like, hey, this is Dev. I'm not here right now. You know, leave leave message after the tone. So I, I, I left a lot of phone messages. I don't know how many, but I left. Say, hey, Dev, um, I emailed you. That is Neil. Um, can you please respond to me? Nothing. So I left phone messages. I, I emailed him. And I was in the United States uh, a month later doing this business plan competition. And, you know, as fate would have it, we met, we won this competition that allow us to go to like the global final, you know, the largest MBA business plan competition in the world, which happens to be held in Austin, Texas, the headquarters of Whole Foods. So, so what do you think? What do you think? Knowing, knowing my story until now, Robert, what do you think I did? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you showed up in his office. Bro. I did show up. Um, <laughs> but, but the but the story is so funny because I went to the headquarters of Whole Foods in Austin, Texas, and true story. I um oh yeah, yeah I, I I went. I only had three days that I was there for the business plan. So okay, I went there the first day, and I remember going to the receptionist, and she said, uh, "Do you have an appointment?" And I said, "No, um, but I am here to see you know Dev da da da." And I said, "I've I've been emailing him and." And I, I even said, like, we know each other, which is not true. Uh, anyway, she, and, and then she's like, uh, if, you, if you don't have an appointment, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the building or I'm going to call security guard. What? what? Yeah. Oh, my God. So, that's so harsh. Yeah, it's a bit hard. Uh, okay. So I, I, I was standing in front of, of Whole Foods, and I was thinking to myself, like, man, I mean, he has to come out of the building at some point. And if I stand here long oh, enough, God. if I stand here long enough, and I know what he looks like, you know, I'm gonna see him. Uh, or <laughs> <You're> okay, <laughs> I'm not sure. So that was going on in my head, and I said, okay, but but since I'm already here, so let me try um, calling him some more. And you know, as you wouldn't believe it, he picked up the phone, like, and I guess maybe oh, the. Oh. Anyway, so he picked up the phone and I said, look, hey, hey, Dev, this is Neil. Um, uh, you know, I, I, f I flew all the way from Thailand just to see you. <laughs> and I made a joke about it. And, and he's like, oh, you're the guy that's been leaving all this voicemail on my machine. Um, so I yes, I am that guy. And I said, well, I'm here now. Um, I'm, I came all the way from Thailand to see you. Uh, you know, can you uh, talk with me for five minutes? And he thought about it. He's like, okay, come back here at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, like, the funniest part of all this is I was there to compete in the largest MBA business plan in the world, like MBA level business plan, right? It was like the World right, Cup of right. business plan. And as it turned out, my pitch is the next morning. So, so when he told me that it's seven a.m., I actually have my pitch. Like I, I have to to pitch uh, for this business plan competition. So I actually told him, um, "Can it be seven <laughs> thirty? <laughs> I mean, more, oh more my time. God. <laughs> he, he, goes, he goes like uh, he, he must have been shocked that I asked you to change the time, you know. I said, Can you can you make it half an hour later? And he said, Okay. But but I start work at eight o'clock, so you won't have a lot of time. So I said, okay, I only need five minutes, so it's okay. And I remember going to the pitch at this uh, 
you know, competition at seven o'clock in the morning. And the judges normally like, uh, you know, Q&A, right? The team, they are very enthusiastic. I kept looking at my watch and the judges were like sitting there, like you're sitting there right now, like super serious. And they go like, do you have, do you have somewhere you have to be? So they were getting agitated yeah. with me. Yeah. 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 I have a meeting with Whole Foods, 7.30. And one for of the judges, for this product, yeah. yeah. And yeah. One, one of the judges like, go, go, like. <laughs> that you know, was like, amazing. Get Good out. for them. By the way, we didn't win that competition, but I didn't care, like, at that point, you know? It, well, yeah. yeah. So, I, yeah. so I had a time with this uh, buyer, uh, uh, you know, at the time, was a global buyer of Whole Food, so we um, got he got the global buyer of Whole Food to come with us to come sit with us, and and you know, we I told him about a uh, jasmine rice, and I even cooked some for them. Like, so I brought some cooked rice. I made like a cold salad, and they were like eating the whole office was eating, it, and they said, "Wow, this is incredible." And then, you know, this is the global buyer of Whole Food. He said, "Neil, I'm very impressed." Um, we, we're going to take your product on board. And I'm like, I don't have a product yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's like, uh, you've just I eaten the product. I have to go back and get the farmers to grow the rice. But I needed to be sure that I can sell it. Because I can't just go and get the, all the farmers to grow this and say, like you said, you know, then I go to the market and people say, oh, you know, we, we're not going to do it. So imagine he, uh, he was very mad at me. He's like, was he? Was he? Yeah, yeah, he was actually a little bit because, I, you know, I, I um, obviously I, I didn't do anything the conventional way. So, <laughs> but, um, but, but, but the thing was, yes, he, he understood in the end. At the beginning, he's like, what do you mean you don't? And why are you meeting with me? So I started explaining to him more. And then eventually he came around to it. And he's like, you know what? I love your project. When you are ready, get back to me. So it was. Of course. That's amazing. Oh, that is crazy. So, yeah. So that, so that you, was. So you, yeah. That was a crazy so you day. Go, you go. <laughs> crazy day. <laughs> It's a crazy story, the whole bloody thing. I can't believe it. It's a, like, again, did you, have you ever had a conversation with the guy at Whole Foods and say, what did you think when this student showed up and stopped and kept bugging you and showed up in your, like, did you ever ask them what he thought? Yeah, no, he, he said that he, he met with me because I was really determined. And even though, you know, like he, you know, he, he, he could really feel that I, because he get a lot of approaches every day, right, from people that want to sell product to Whole Foods. Um, and, and he said, like, yeah, like, just the fact that you kept, you really, um, you know, persisted and you were determined. So he did appreciate it, that, that quality. And that's, that's why he met up with me. And, and after, of course, learning about his story, he said that it was a very a uh, noble, I mean, amazing thing that I, that I wanted to do for my country. So it was one of those things. I mean, he was annoyed and <laughs> of course, but, but I think it's, yeah, like it's, I don't know. I should ask that this question bad. often, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, for, sure. for sure. Listen, it is so fascinating, man. This is, I mean, first of all, I'm dying to get into the effect it's had, the impact it's had. But the idea of everything that you've done and how you went about it is just so inspiring to people. You know, there's so many people that think, oh, it's not possible. It couldn't be me. Well, you're proof it could be. You know, you're obviously an exceptionally gifted gifted person, you know, so it takes nothing away from the fact that you are a gifted person. But the interesting part about you is that you're, you're incredibly unassuming. You're a very humble character. I mean, just, you know, witnessing your reaction to the experience of the farmers. So I think that that, um, you have such a wonderful story to tell. So I just want to say thank you so much 
for for this first introduction, and um, I'll uh, I'll shoot you a note about scheduling round two of our discussion. Thank you, Robert. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of our interview with Neil DeCrazic, CEO of Jazzberry. Neil's another example of how business goes beyond just lining wallets with money and instead has the power to not only uplift individuals, but communities and societies as well. I'd wish Neil luck, but I know his raw determination and passion is all he needs to create success. And remember, if you enjoyed our interview, please hit like and subscribe for more great stories of inspired entrepreneurs. We hope to see you next time.